Good evening, everyone. There's a little bit of a line, but we're going to get started with some of the housekeeping stuff and maybe jump into the articles. Um, we do have a quorum, so I'm going to start the meeting at 8 before 7. 6.42. Um, quorum being present. Uh, I'd just like to introduce our new clerk, Amy Akel. Did I get that right? Akel? Akel, yes. Comes from us from Ipswich. Uh, we do have tellers if we need to hand count or do a secret ballot. Uh, we have Wendy Fossa, Karen Green, Rob Fitzgibbons, Diane Johnson, Don Burnham, and Luke DeFiori. Those would be the tellers. Um, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you can remain standing for a second, we'd like to uh, remember two people that were former employees, volunteers, committee members. We had Sandy, or Herman Sandy Patrickin, and we had Caroline Cassidy. Caroline was my first grade teacher. Um, my kid, my, my daughter's had her as well. It goes back a little ways. So if we could take a moment to remember them. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, I have verified that the warrant has been posted in all the required places, including online. So that's that's happened. Um, I will take a motion to waive the reading of the of the warrant. Is there a second? All those in favor? Uh, any opposed? Uh, just so we can start the procedures. When I call for a vote, I'm going to have you raise your card, yay or nay. I'll ask for yays and nays. I'm going to raise the card. It makes it easy for me to see as opposed to going with voice counts. We've been doing that for a couple of years now. It's worked out pretty well. Um, you'll also need this if we happen to have a secret ballot. You'll have to bring it up front, get it X'd, and you'll get a card, yes or no, and we can go through that procedure if and when it happens. Uh, the Finance Committee Chair. Does the Finance Committee support the financial articles? All of them? Thank you. Uh, any non-voters, non-residents that are here? There's a section over here. If you don't have a green voting card, that means you're not registered or you're a non-resident. You need to be sitting over there. It makes it easier for us to count as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to also introduce Greg Corbo, town council. He's one of the few, few that get to sit up front here and interact with us. So it's uh, nice to have him here. And uh, if we have to, like I said, if we have a secret ballot, I will go through those directions as we need them. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to move to Article 1. He can't see you because I'm in the way. It's not on. Now you should be. I, Jody Harris, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $1,800 for unpaid bills from past fiscal years. Is there a second? Any discussion at all? This, this vote takes uh, nine tenths to uh, go through. So, all those in favor of Article One, raise your card. Any opposed? Raise your motion. Passes. Article Two. I can you? Is that working? It's working? OK. It is. <laughs> I, Lisa O'Donnell, move that the town vote to amend six, section 6-2.2 6 of the town zoning bylaws definitions to delete the definition of nonconforming use pre-existing 
and to add other definitions, including a new definition, non-conforming pre-existing that replaces non-conforming use pre-existing. All as shown in Article 2 of the Fall Town Meeting Warrant. Is there a second? Discussion, Lisa? Uh, this is kind of a housekeeping article, and the definitions are not regulatory anyway. They're provided in the bylaw uh, to surprisingly define terms that are used in the bylaw. Um, most of these terms are being added because of uh, special permit categories that we added at the May town meeting. So you will see things like adult entertainment, um, composting facility, drive-through event venue, things like that are being added because they were added to the special permit category. So now we're following up with definitions of those. Uh, there's some other... Um, like scientific research and development that has been in the bylaw that never had a definition. So we're just trying to catch up with different terms that had um, been missing or have been added. Um, the one that I do want to kind of point out is accessory dwelling unit. There is legislation coming from the state effective this coming February that's going to permit accessory dwelling units, ADUs by right on properties with single family homes. So we kind of wanted to get out ahead of that legislation because that will go into effect before we have time to do anything on our end regarding ADUs for probably May town meeting. So, so that's in here as well. So, any further discussion? If yeah, John, just that, if, if you're going to speak to an article when it's been already proposed, if you could actually get up to a microphone ahead of time. That would be great. That just moves things along, and I can see if we have any more discussion to, to go along. So, and when you come up, state your name, address, please. John Guerin, Belcher Street. Um, one section in here refers to farm, and uh, 48 section three, I have a copy of it here, and it refers to five acres or more, or two acres, not three, and you, in the next article, the same mistake has happened. The, uh, the two acres are, I'm sorry? So chapter 40A, section three, refers to either five acres more uh, or more for a farm uh, to parcels or two acres or more if the sale of products, et cetera, um, add up. Your definition of farm um, says three acres, not two. So if you want to amend it, it needs to be fixed. You can't actually have the zoning um, that prohibits it. But, right. No, I, I get that. Um, OK. I, I'm sorry we missed that. We had town council review it, so I thought we were set. Um, so I will. Um, you want to just amend your motion to include? I will amend the motion to include the revision of three acres to two acres on the definition of farm. Is there a second to that amendment? All those in favor? Right. Now we will move to back to the main motion. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, this uh, actually requires two thirds as it's the zoning change. Uh, all those in favor of Article 2, raise your card. All those opposed? The motion passes by two thirds. Before we go to Article 3, Lisa, before we go to Article 3, I believe the selectmen have a presentation to do and then we'll move on. There's also still people out front, so we're going to hopefully get them filtered in before we move to Article 3. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us tonight. So as is tradition at Fall Town Meeting, we always recognize employees that have served the community for certain lengths of time. I'm not sure if I saw Nicholas Ouellette in the gymnasium this evening. Is Nick Ouellette with us from the fire department? <laughs> Working. 
Okay, so recognizing Nicholas Ouellette for 20 years of service to the Essex Fire Department, we'll make sure he gets his award. Is George Stavros in the room? No. All right, so George Stavros has been with the Essex Fire Department for 35 years. So a warm welcome for George Stavros, please. I saw Michael Galley. Michael, if you'd care to join me. This is for Michael Galley, the superintendent of the DPW for 35 years of service. Next is the uh, Employee of the Year. So again, traditionally at Fall Town Meeting, we recognize an Employee of the Year that's gone above and beyond for the community, as well as a Volunteer of the Year, which we'll get to next. So I'm very excited because this particular employee is somebody that I call a, a friend. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Jeff Thomas makes life easier for everybody at Town Hall. Since Jeff started his position as the Administrative Clerk for the Board of Health on January 4th, 2023, he has streamlined tasks in the office and built out Essex's online permitting system to include the Board of Health permits, eliminating the need to pay an outside vendor to do this. He's cleaned up the building, plumbing, gas, electrical permits so that the process is much more efficient. He goes above and beyond when trying to answer questions from confused residents or irate contractors who are unable to get in touch with officials from other part-time departments and he's taken it upon himself to learn more about the Board of Health's regulatory authority and requirements so that he's able to be more informed when people do call with questions. Jeff is kind and thoughtful to everyone he encounters and takes on any task with a smile and willingness to jump in, help out, and do more. He's already changed the tone with his time here at work to help all of us be more positive. Jeff, come on up. you're gonna be on the hot seat for another minute. So this evening's volunteer of the year is Lisa O'Donnell. Lisa has been on the planning board for five years and was a selectman for nine. As chair of the planning board, she's done an amazing job at carefully steering the town toward a long time goal of creating more comprehensive zoning. Lisa has tirelessly worked with various members of not only her board, but other boards in town, town employees and countless residents. She's guided the planning board to bring order to an old zoning regulation and has cleaned up the old outdated language to sim simplify for the residents what actually already existed before moving toward new zoning regulations that have been sorely needed. Lisa set a goal of working on zoning in small bite-sized pieces and I can say that she certainly has done just that. She's held countless forums for taxpayers to come forward and ask their questions, draw on maps, discuss their concerns and learn more, learn more about this project. Many thanks to Lisa for leading this project. All set. Can we have just one more round of applause for all of those individuals? We're going to move to Article 3. Before I do that, uh, Madam Chair, does the Planning Board have a hearing on, on these two articles? Thank you. I forgot to ask the first time, so I'm asking the second time. Okay, thank you. Article 3. I, Lisa O'Donnell, move that the town vote to amend the town's zoning map 
by adding the village residential zoning district and the rural residential zoning district to said zoning map and to amend the town zoning bylaws section 6-3 establishment of districts by adding a new section 6-3.3.5 village residential zoning district section 6-3.3.6 rural residential zoning district and to amend section 6-4 use regulations by adding section 6-4.1.4 land use descriptions and requirements all as shown in article 3 of the fall town meeting warrant is there a second? Discussion. Lisa's going to be right up. I'll start because I'm going to be long-winded. <clears throat> Essex has not historically had zoning use districts like most municipalities since we are small, out of the way, and with development limited by both our sewer availability and land suited for septic systems. But as land pressures increase in the Northeast and especially the Metro Boston, Metro Boston area, it's becoming more essential to plan ahead for how we want to manage our resources. And implementing use districts in town is one way to reasonably manage our future and our growth, which is how other, all other towns around us do this work. Use districts are basically areas of any town that are defined on a map and with a bylaw regulation listing the uses that are and are not permitted in that area. Typical use districts are residential, commercial, and industrial, with many other specific types, like, for example, Gloucester's Marine Industrial District. About 10 years ago, town meeting in Essex voted to create our first use districts ever, which were small residential areas at Kenoma Point, which allowed the delineation of small lot sizes and different dimensional standards than the rest of town, which allowed the town to sell many of these parcels. So these two tiny districts are currently our only residential districts here in Essex. The next district that was developed by the planning board is the downtown district, which comprises most of the area along Main Street. <clears throat> which, when the map comes up, will be shown in red crosshatch at the center of town. <laughs> All righty, there we are. So there's the, um, so that's the red cross hatch on the map. This district was intended to reduce dimensional standards for this area, which also has a lot of non-conforming small lots and to allow mixed use in a building by right. This district was approved at the May 20... <laughs> This district was approved at the May 2021 town, annual town meeting. At that same town meeting, voters approved a temporary moratorium on change of use from residential or open property to business or industrial use by well more than the two-thirds vote needed for a bylaw change. Since then, town meeting has also overwhelmingly supported two extensions of this moratorium. So through these votes, the members of town meeting have essentially said that, yes, zoning and land use regulations need to be studied and updated to protect neighborhoods and residential properties. So the work that the planning board has undertaken since that time has been in response to these votes and residents' concerns about their neighborhoods, although, like the downtown district, the planning board could propose bylaw changes on their own, <clears throat> since the planning board's job is to study the needs of the town. As a result of this work, with grants from the state for help from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, the past three town meetings have approved zoning bylaw changes which have helped to better organize the bylaw and to provide additional guidelines and regulations for property uses in Essex. In May 2023, the bylaw was reorganized with no changes to the substance or intent. 
Last November at town meeting, the main change was to formalize the general use district, which currently includes about 98% of the land in Essex, so everything that's not at Kanoma Point or the downtown district, and where all uses are permitted, including residential, business, and industrial. So this is how things stand now, that anything can go anywhere except Kanoma Point. In addition, at that meeting, the site plan review requirements were updated to require a better notification and a public hearing when a property changes use, which makes the process more transparent, but does not provide any ability to deny a proposed use. At the last town meeting in May, voters adopted several new special permit categories, as well as expanded guidelines and standards for special permits to help both applicants and the planning board. Again, these allow the planning board to review proposed property uses and condition them, but do not, outside of particularly disruptive uses, typically allow for a denial. Property uses are permitted in Essex through the building permit process, including site plan review by the planning board when warranted, particularly for significant changes or a change of use. Some uses require a special permit from the planning board, which is a more rigorous process than a site plan review, and which includes a public hearing and a better notification. If the use and or buildings are approved, the planning board writes a decision which the applicant records with the property deed with the registry. This process has more opportunities for the planning board to impose limitations and also the ability to reject an application if it doesn't meet established criteria. The point of all that is that the regulations we have in place now are a bit stronger in terms of regulating how a new commercial use could impact the surrounding area, but in no manner do they create areas where commercial uses are limited or excluded, which is the typical goal of residential zoning districts. And so now we are at the next step in working towards providing better protection for residents in neighborhoods, and that is to propose residential districts, which is what the article before us now defines. I'm not going to go into a lot of background of the process that brought the current proposal, since we have a lot to talk about tonight, but please know that we've been working towards this for years and with an intensive effort in the last, since May's, last May's town meeting, including weekly public workshops, forums, flyers, deep dives into material from other boards and organizations, including surveys by other groups, more recent surveys by the MAPC, and our own survey on acceptable commercial uses. We have engaged with residents and business owners as much as we could and have considered all feedback through six different iterations of the zoning district map, along with multiple versions of the bylaw language itself. What rises to the surface in all this background work is the special environment of Essex, with the river and marshes and wooded uplands, as well as the small town feel of the community, including our local businesses. While we looked at how other nearby towns have divided their land areas, we have not tried to copy these, since other towns provide smaller and more specific areas for commercial and industrial uses, and Essex has evolved more organically. We considered the existing property uses based on the assessor's use categories to help understand the established use patterns in town. This showed us where businesses tend to grow and which areas are more residential in nature, again, helping to inform where districts would be appropriate. The board also considered the areas of town that are on the sewer system and are, therefore, more suitable for future development. And although current sewer flow is limited, this may not always be the case in the future. Resident input from survey and workshops, along with the use patterns, helped steer us towards creating two types of districts, which you can see from the map, are the village residential district and the rural residential district. The village residential district is the area in the purple shade on the map and in, it's not shaded in the, in the warrant, but goes, there's four maps there with that part of the warrant. And the rural residential district is shown in green. It's important to also consider that the areas that are not highlighted as either of the new proposed districts, and these are the maps, these are the areas that will remain in the general use district, which are white on the map and are not on the maps in the bylaw, in the warrant. The continued role of the general use district is important since all uses, residential, business, and industrial can still develop by right in these areas. And since areas of town are still open for all these uses, we don't need to consider creating separate commercial or industrial districts. The areas in general use remain as they are today with all types of uses as options. So the village and rural residential districts are essentially carved out of the existing general use district and therefore much of the material in each section of the bylaw includes the same language, which is what's in the warrant, is the bylaw language for the village and the rural districts. 
So I will first note the aspects of the two proposed districts that would not change from how they are regulated now as they sit in the general use district. Dimensional and density regulations do not change. Parking regulations do not change. Accessory structure regulations do not change. Types of residential use and how they are permitted do not change. And last but not least, home occupations do not change and would still be permitted throughout town. For each of the proposed districts, the first several paragraphs of the bylaw sections that are in the warrant covers the description and purpose for establishing the district. For each, the use table is next, which is the most important part, where the uses are listed as permitted, allowed by special permit, or not allowed. Parking, accessory structures, and dimensional regulations follow, and each section ends with a portion addressing non-conforming uses. Again, this is the same format as the general use district. The main difference between the general use district and the residential districts are that, are that are proposed to be deducted from this larger area is that commercial and industrial uses are restricted or prohibited, and I will walk through each district to highlight what would and would not be permitted in the future. First, however, to address existing businesses that would fall into a residential zoning district under the proposal. All existing uses by state law are vested in perpetuity, which is the proper term for grandfathered, as long as they stay in operation, including up to a two-year closure. The proposed bylaw language for each new district allows for both these for a change for both a change of business use for these properties and expansion of the facilities at these properties through the special permit process. This is covered in the last section of the proposed district bylaw regulations right before the maps for each section in the warrant. The proposed village district areas are closer to the center of town and are on either ends of the downtown district and out along western and eastern avenues. In these areas, although both business and industrial uses are shown as not permitted, this section proposes a new business use which is called a village business. The intent of creating this new type of business category, which is defined at the end of the article in changes to section 6-4, is to define a business use that can be considered appropriate for <clears throat> and in the scale of the neighborhood where it is proposed to be located. It's not wine, I promise. <laughs> Therefore, a village business is a by right permitted use in the village district areas. This means that any existing business that fits the scale of the village business can make changes through the simpler site plan review process. This section also allows an existing vacant or residential property to convert to a village business through the special permit process which is done to include a butter notification and a public hearing as part of the process, as well as a written and binding permit by the planning board. Then the more rural areas towards the outskirts of town are included in the rural residential district. The rural residential district would not permit new business or industrial uses except for bed and breakfast establishments. This is a very typical type of residential districts in all towns around us and in most of the state. Note also that no additional limits are put on types of residences beyond those already in place, nor does it limit accessory buildings or home occupations. Then after the proposed bylaw sections for the two new residential districts, in the Warren article, there is the new definition for village business as an addition to section 6-4 of the zoning bylaw covering use regulations. This section describes the characteristics and features of a neighborhood scale business that would fit into the residential area with minimal disruption. The criteria that will be used to evaluate a proposal's suitability for siting in a residential neighborhood will include concerns like adequate off-street parking, limited increases in traffic, other safety and infrastructure concerns like emergency access, access to necessary utilities, including sewer, <clears throat> hours of operation, size and scale of buildings, and other site features, including signage and displays and effects on the surrounding area, including light, noise, odors, and other interferences that could extend beyond property lines. Municipal uses are also defined here, since these are included in the table of uses for each of the proposed districts. So that's the overview of what this article proposes to create, two new residential districts as drawn on the map. 
Again, in the village district, village businesses would be permitted as new uses, but the rural district does not allow for new business uses and is intended to remain primarily residential. Thank you for bearing with me through all that. It's a lot. So before we move on to any other discussion, <clears throat> I want to recognize Senator Bruce Tower, who's here nice and early. He can want to, I'll give him a few words to speak. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and through you to the members of the town meeting. I first want to express my deep appreciation for you recognizing I was here early. Uh, I don't hear that very often, but when I do, I want to take note of it. Mr. Moderator, I know that uh, there are a number of uh, very complex matters on the warrant tonight, and it's very encouraging to see the turnout here tonight of so many folks invested in the future of the community coming together to make those decisions. I will give you only a very brief update about what's happening on Beacon Hill in the interest of trying not to distract too much from that conversation. Uh, we presently are in what is known as the informal session of the legislature, uh, which began at the end of July. And informal session is reserved for matters that are non-controversial and routine, and for which there is no debate and no roll calls that are taken. Unfortunately, there was major legislation that did not get completed by that deadline at the end of July. One was an economic development bill, and the second was a climate adaptation bill. In order to have those properly considered, uh, I moved in the Senate to be able to modify the rules so that we could have debate and we could take roll calls so that you would know how people were voting on those matters. And I'm pleased to report that the climate change bill uh, did pass and it will expedite the uh, development of more renewable energy generation and the economic development bill, which literally will provide hundreds of millions of dollars for economic development throughout the Commonwealth, also passed both with debate and both with roll call votes. So we were able to make some progress on those things and I look forward to providing you more information about that through other medium uh, than standing at the microphone at town meeting when you have a lot of business to do. Uh, but I'll just conclude by saying it, it is truly an honor to represent you and to continue to represent you. Appreciate being returned to office for another term. And on nights like this, I'm so proud of this community to see so many people come out and engage in the kind of vigorous, informed debate that issues like the ones that are before you tonight deserve. Thank you all very much. It's good to be with you. Would you like to finish up for me? <laughs> okay, any? I'd like to make a motion for a secret ballot on this article. Uh, we can do that. Um, hmm? So all those in favor, oh, is there a second to that? Sorry. All those in favor of a secret ballot, raise your card. Plenty of those. Any opposed? Just needs 20%. We're good. So we're going to have a secret ballot on this when it comes to a vote. So we're going to move forward to any other discussion. Oh, sorry. Someone, we can hand you a mic. All right. Here we go. Sorry about that. Tough getting old. Uh, my name is Wesley Burnham, uh, 22 County Road. I'm a current member of the DPW uh, engineer and uh, previous planning board. I was originally elected to the planning board in 1985. Since that time, I served almost six full terms. I quit a year, year and a half early take the position on the DPW. So I've been through this near as I can recollect. This will be the fourth time we've tried to figure out how to zone Essex. We haven't been successful yet. If you want to go back and have some interesting reading, go back to the 1972 era minutes, because there's a ton of minutes involved in trying to figure out how to make this work. But by then, everything was already spread out enough that to make reasonable districts was virtually impossible. So we stuck with the individual land use requirements and it's worked pretty well. This particular map behind me, 
I'm almost insulted to, to look at it. It's exclusionary, it's prohibitive, and virtually nowhere on there, on either of these two districts, could a reasonable man expect to start a business and operate under the rules that they've got here. I mean, it's, you go down the list of uses, and it's either special permit or not allowed. The special permit issue we were trying to get away from by building a known box, either what you wanted to do fit inside the box, or it didn't. And that way, the neighbors knew what the capabilities or possibilities were, and you didn't have six or seven people on their own volition and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, on winging decisions for anyone else concerned, because with no standard, which there's none here, special permit stuff is wide open. And I was pushing to get away from the special permits for most things. They've got an appropriate place, no two ways about that. Uh, and we've used them successfully over the years. They've also been abused over the years. So without going through and nitpicking everything to death, especially since I'm running out of strength in my leg to stand up, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to let's vote this down. We can revisit it. But we gotta come up with a better way to deal with business uses, industrial uses. Part of the one of the other things I did do was a long-term planning committee for three, four years. That rolled into the strategic planning committee for upwards of eight or nine years. And that's still in place. But one of the things we discussed in there, in both of those committees in the long-term look at, was trying to figure out how to promote business in Essex so we could get some tax base without having to pay all of the exorbitant fees for kids and schools and the rest of it. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I ask you to let's send this back to the drawing board. Thank you. Take a break, Wes. Um, if you're gonna speak to the article, get to a mic so we can move this along. Anyone else, any other discussion? Go ahead over here. Uh, William Bruce, uh, 51 Pond Street. Most people know me Pick a as Angus. Right there too. Um, I've been a developer my whole life, pretty much, building and developing. Um, I've developed hundreds of units. Um, I'm very familiar with zoning. Um, and I agree, this is enormously restrictive. I think what Essex has got that no other town has is sort of a fixed control on itself. It doesn't have an enormous draw for business. Um, and this is enormously business unfriendly. We're already struggling to keep businesses here. Yes, I like a bedroom community, but I also like to have businesses. I like to have a downtown. I like people to be able to come in if they're willing to start a business. Um, where we already are losing businesses, um, I don't know who's going to come in, but with the restrictions in this, I don't think you're going to get anybody. It's too difficult. Um, we need the ability to be very flexible because we're so spread out. We don't have a lot of good areas for business, so if somebody wants to work one in, I think they need that opportunity. Um, am I for zoning? Yes, I do think zoning is important. We don't want someone to 
come in and do some drastic amount of development and change all of Essex. But based on the way Essex is set up, I don't see that's very likely. We have some open spaces that will get developed, but they're available for development. Um, and I don't see anything in the immediate future, based on the past, that's going to put Essex in a oh my goodness situation. Um, and I do see this as so restrictive that we're going to have to depend on just residential taxes because we're not going to have any business. And that's going to make life enormously expensive for a lot of people that live here that can't afford it. We need business. It offsets our task. It, and it also gives us what we have downtown, which I want to have stay. I like. I don't mind the tourism. I don't think it's, you know, a few people like to, oh my goodness, but it is part of Essex. It always has been. And I can put up with a little traffic, um, but I would vote no on this. Thank you. John? John Byrne, 28 Choate Street. Um, I just wanted to express my opinion that we have enough control in the bylaws as they are for business. And I know because I did it, I moved here, I don't know, 40 years ago, and I had to go through, I had a business, I had an existing business, I moved to town, and had to go through all of the bylaws and all of the, the um, restrictions on how to put a business into Essex. And I think we're fine with what we have. I don't think we need to change it at all. It's worked for a long time. And I hate to say it, but if we all moved here or were born here and didn't have a choice, but anybody that moved here, moved here to Essex because of what it was, not what they wanted it to be. And if you want it to be something else, and I'm really sorry, but go back to where you came from because we all love Essex the way it is. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Let's vote no. I'm gonna go over here. Uh, Tom DeMeo, Water Street. Um, just two things. I didn't really appreciate that last comment. Um, second, um, I'd just like to challenge anybody that's coming up with generalizations about how restrictive this is maybe to come up with a real world example of what might be blocked by this that might actually be realistic in this town. Like, come up with a real world example of something that might not work out because of this zoning. Can I go over here? Vicki Cataldo, 125 Rocky Hill Road. <clears throat> I'm also the assistant town clerk and I looked it up this past week, and this year alone, we have had 20 new businesses come into town. Not renewals, just 20 new businesses. So you, I'm sorry, I don't believe that anything that we are doing now or have done in the past is keeping businesses away. It doesn't seem possible. And we have been talking about this for at least 30 years. I've been here for 46 years, and this is, keeps coming up again and again. I think that this planning board has done a fabulous job on looking at the whole town and respecting what the voters want, and I urge you to support it. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, Judd Lane, 21 Lanes Road. Um, I'm kind of discouraged about this whole thing. I was on the planning board last year, ended my term in May. Um, 20 years ago, I was on with Wesley for a, a stint on the planning board, and all that green up there that you see was open, uh, a general use district before, and now it's no business allowed in there. 
Okay, so how you can say that that's not going to affect the town drastically, you've, that's, it's unbelievable. Um, is, are the owners of Cape Ann Sup here? Any, there he is. Hey, Judd, I want Judd, to, I want to stick to the article. Okay. If they want to speak, they can speak. All right. Well, I just want to give a shout out to them because that's one of the businesses that would be blocked with this kind of green. Um, he has a business on the corner of um, Main Street and where it forks off um, to Southern and Eastern Ave. And he, he, he grew up with my son, grew up loving Essex, going down river. They love doing things on the river, doing surfing. Their parents live with them, so it's kind of a mixed-use thing. I think that's what the fabric of Essex is all about. It's the mixed-use, it's um, having families, being able to have multiple generations and doing what they want, being able to start a business, a small business. Is anyone offended by Cape Ann Sup? How many people don't want them to be able to succeed? or to be able to start in one of those green areas. Um, the other thing, last year um, when this started, the goal of the planning board was, and they told everybody that came to the forums, oh, we're just going to carve out mostly um, residential districts that are all residential, and we're going to make them residential and not let the business in. Well, what they did was, they surrounded all the businesses that exist, and they made it all non-business. The green is all, you can't do anything, okay? There's no business allowed. Um, I'm in that area, except they left me white. And why did they leave me white? Because I already have a conservation restriction on my property. It doesn't mean I can do anything with my property. I already restricted it. So another problem I have with this map is all that white in there that you see, those blocks, most of it is 61A, 61B. It's already restricted. So there are no new businesses there. Okay, so again, they're saying, oh, well, there's all this extra space. You can do it. it there's not extra space. One last point, and I won't belabor this, but they crammed all the business down into the downtown district and some village business district. There's no parking there. We have very restrictive parking rules. You can't get a business unless you have off-street parking. The only reasons um, a couple of the restaurants are able to survive down on the causeway is because there's enough parking to share in Woodman's, and they have to do a contract with them in order to get parking in order to meet the bylaws. So again, we are totally crammed in the dis uh, downtown district. There's no parking left. That is our huge issue, as along with the wetlands. Um, up there in the blue area, see all the white? Well, that's all marsh and wetlands. So they're saying, oh, well, that's a general use district. You can't build or do anything there. So I would hope that, you know, I, um, I love the young people feeling like they can do anything in Essex, go, go get them be able to start a business, and I would hope that you would vote against this and, and give the young people and future generations the opportunity that these guys had. Cape Ansop. Thank you. Meg Nelson, 35 Belcher Street. When my children were in kindergarten, the school provided all kindergartners with school bus transportation. So being on Belcher Street, I wondered why my children weren't being transported. So I went down and spoke with the principal, and he said he'd look into it. So the principal got together with the police chief, and they took a drive down Belcher Street, and they got back to me and let me know that Belcher Street was far too narrow and too unsafe to bring a school bus down that road. Fast forward to today, and there is a commercial waste hauling business located at 34 Belcher Street that has multi-ton trucks with huge roll-off dumpsters
being transported up and down Belcher Street that at some places you cannot pass two cars at the same time and the line of sight is impossible. You can't see what's coming at you. But yet here we are because there is no restriction at all on commercial development on lots on Belcher Street or any other street that has, there's no change of use before the planning board, there's no notification to abutters or anyone else because it was vacant land and it's the first use that's put on the land. And that can happen anywhere in town where there are sufficient acreage to allow for any type of dimensional restrictions or parking restrictions or anything else. So people say it can't happen because we're already protected. Well, guess what? We're not because that operation was a surprise to most people. And for people who are directly abutting it, there's a huge noise problem. So it's not just the trucks traveling up and down the street and what they're doing to the tiny road. It's also the neighbors that are being disturbed by the operation that's there. And I fail to see how restricting places that are truly residential, like the Apple Streets and the Belcher Streets and other similar streets, is going to restrict development in the downtown area. So I urge people who are concerned about this type of development in inappropriate areas to vote for the residential district. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Moulton and I live at 132 John Wise Avenue. And I'm here to vote no and ask everyone else to vote no. And to give real life example is we are a business, we are located on a state highway and the zoning is going to restrict us as residential. I feel that the story like we just heard, I think that there is need for zoning. I think there is a need for both sides to work together. I just don't think that this plan is ready for the approval. Um, I feel like a lot of it was personally picked and choose. And in, in a real life example, is that I, a landscape company, am zoned residential, but two properties, three properties down from me, my competitor, also a landscaper, is not zoned that way. And they can, they can do whatever they want without special permit, but I cannot. And I feel that on 133, which is a state highway, we're not talking about, quote, neighborhoods. I think that the zone, I think it just went too far. I think it's the right mindset was there. I think the right things are there. I think it just needs a lot more work. So I just respectfully ask people to vote no. Thank you. Hi, Brett Prince, 7 Essex Reach Road. I'd like to thank Lisa and the planning board for all the, the work that's gone on uh, and all the hearings and all the times that we've had an opportunity to weigh in and provide some input into this proposal. I think it's important to distinguish between business and commercial use and that we can start businesses, but when we're talking about growing business or commercial use in Essex, I don't think any of us in our residential areas are looking for a new commercial property to pop up or industrial property to pop up next door to us to enable increased business in Essex. And when we look at the map and we look at the green areas, I don't think we look at those and think that's a great place for another commercial area or another downtown. And when we think about some of the businesses that have been mentioned tonight, they're in the downtown district a district which happens to have several vacant storefronts right now where we would all benefit from increased density from our businesses, allowing the residential areas to remain residential. We all want businesses to succeed. If you have a business, a commercial building in this, in this town, it will remain as such. Zoning is always forward looking. It doesn't change anything going backwards. So what you have, you get to keep. But as we look at how we develop this town, this allows us to provide the protections that retain neighborhoods as neighborhoods for residents and allows areas where we can have commercial in the downtown so that we get the density we need for successful businesses. So thank you and please vote yes. Um, 
Meredith Paulus, 85 John Wise Ave. I, for quite some time, I've lived here for 10 years. Um, I know that qualifies me as a newbie, um, but I'm gonna stand up and say what I think because a lot of the people I care about most grew up in Essex and I care deeply about them and their livelihood. Um, my understanding of the new bylaw changes has brought me to ask a question based on some things that I saw in all the interchanges um, that have been going back and forth over the last couple of days. And I wonder if I could have a question answered by somebody on the planning board. Um, my question is, it's a somewhat specific scenario. Bearing in mind that I plan to vote yes for the bylaws, I do have concern about where certain kinds of small businesses would like to make their business, including places like Cape Ann Stand Up Paddleboard Company. What they've built is extraordinary. It's not just a building and a home, it's a community hub. And I think that's the kind of business we all want to make more room for in our town. And we should be doing everything that we can to support that kind of thing. Um, a specific example was brought up, and I want to know the answer to this question before I cast my vote yes. If, if a small business owner had some land in Essex that was in a residential area, but it was a large enough piece of land that they could potentially have a business there, would they be allowed to apply for a special permit to get them the right to have that small business within that residential area? Is that a possibility? Want to answer that? The way the bylaw is written now, or the proposed bylaw sections, is that right would absolutely be possible in the village district areas, um, which were deliberately laid out in our densest areas and um, around the downtown district. So the intent of the village districts was to be able to keep these as um, areas where businesses could grow. In the rural area, the way the, law, the bylaw is written is there are no new business uses on those properties. Most of those areas are, are largely residential, small, narrow roads um, in general. I, I know there's rural residential along John Wise, and even though that's a state highway, there are residences lining that whole area. Um, so the intent was to try and have some areas that are exclusively residential so that people know when they live in those neighborhoods, they are in a residential neighborhood and they don't have to worry and wonder what businesses are coming to town. And a lot of that has to do also with access, not just a particular property, but inviting traffic down some of our smaller streets is not, as Meg mentioned, working out that well all the time. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Unfortunately, it's not the answer I was hoping for because <laughs> I do want to vote yes. And I, I came here fully believing that I was gonna vote yes, but that disappoints me a little. And I don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good in what this zoning can do for us, but I do feel like we need to allow for that kind of um, creative economic gesture by people who do have a little more space, places along John Wise or in uh, along the, the larger pieces of land that are on the periphery. People should be allowed to have small businesses back there, whether they currently exist or not. We all know that they, they work well. The ones that are doing it with respect to their neighbors and with their neighbors together approving of them, I feel like that should be part of this process. I do feel like I'm still going to vote yes, but I do feel like more thoughtfulness needs to be going into that kind of a request. We should be allowing special permit requests. Uh, and we, we do in, in the village area, and the thought was to try and um, develop those areas as more commercial areas, and it's, it's very typical in zoning to have areas that are exclusively residential. And that's um, a, a, a something that towns typically do to create these areas where residents, residents can live and know that they aren't going to have a commercial business pop up next to them. There isn't going to be more traffic on their street because of that. And that was how we separated village versus rural. I understand. Thank you for the answer. I appreciate it. And thank you for the work you've done. John, I'm going to get on the people that haven't spoken yet. Is that a Go ahead. Hi, I'm Shelley Bradbury. I'm at 79 Eastern Ave. Um, I'm on the planning board, but I'm speaking as a resident and a homeowner. 
I'm a small business owner. My husband is a small business owner. We support the businesses here. We eat here. We buy gifts and, and shop here. We hire as many contractors to work on our house as possible. We support businesses, and most of us do here. Um, but I'm a homeowner as well, and um, I'm concerned about, um, for most of us, our homes are our biggest investment, or, or largely one of our biggest investments. And right now, if my neighbor sells his house, I don't know who's going to be there, what type of business. And if a business comes in, I don't know if it's going to hurt my property value. And that's one thing that I haven't heard from the businesses, is what happens when a business opens up and unintentionally ruins the property value? Now, what happens to us? So we are 90%, 90% homeowners pay the taxes. 10% are covered by businesses. Now, our tax rate is the same, 50-50. It's not, it, they don't pay higher or lower, it's equal. And don't get me wrong, I have an incredible landscape business behind me. They go out of their way to make sure all the neighbors are happy. They fix the roads, our driveway, shared driveway when there's divots from the truck. No one has to ask them. They go out of their way to make everybody happy. But there are some that don't. And we don't have enough money in our budget for enforcement. So it's back then to homeowners. And we then take the, the, the value, the loss in our property. Now, we are, this town is one out of five other towns in Massachusetts that doesn't have residential zoning. All of Massachusetts does, except five. All of those towns thrive with businesses, right? They're all thriving. And I just don't understand how the businesses here don't see that, that they'll thrive. But it needs to be a balanced, and homeowners do need protections. And I support this. It's not going to be a perfect map for any, for, for many reasons, but it's where we're starting and we have to start somewhere. And it can evolve as the patterns change. As growth happens, we have to adjust it, but we have to start somewhere. And homeowners deserve some protections as well. So thank you. Go ahead. Jed's already spoken once, so I'm trying to go through people that haven't. Claire Smith, 72 Island Road. I just wanted to point out that I think it seems somewhat naive to say that you might not foresee an oh my goodness situation. Um, without any protection of residential areas, it's possible that every single one of us at any time without zoning could find ourselves in an oh my goodness situation. And while you may love your neighbors right now and everybody may be keeping their land in a bucolic state and everything's fine and well, without zoning, you have no way of knowing what's coming down the pipeline. And it just seems really naive to say everything's okay right now, so it's always going to be that way in the future. And saying that if you're in favor of zoning, just because we are one of the five towns that doesn't have zoning in the entire Commonwealth, Saying that if you're in favor of zoning, you should go back to where you came from, that's probably the attitude that's going to keep businesses away, not zoning. I have full faith and confidence that our planning board has done their due diligence with the utmost thoughtfulness and with more public commentary than I've ever seen in a town operation. And I think that they have landed on the best, again, not the most perfect, but the best solution that will help protect both our business community and our property values. Thank you. Thank you. 
Judd Lane, 21 Lanes Road, again. Um, just a, a note on, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about um, residences. Um, the planning board's goal when I was on the board just a year ago was to carve out residential areas. Now, if they had focused on scenic roads, which is all residential, they could have made those green. It would have made half of these people happy. Okay, but yet they made the whole thing green, including all of 133, which is a state highway. That's the most pro probable um, successful business location because you have traffic, you have people going by you every time. I have um, Museo Designs is what my barn. Okay, people say, oh, this is a great spot. Um, but why did they lock down all of the rest of 133? That doesn't make sense. Um, if the causeway floods in 10 years and we can't use those buildings, basically that's a huge amount of businesses that have to be moved. Where are they gonna move after you make everything green? There's no place for it. 133 is more businesses than residential, so that would be the perfect place for businesses. So my whole take on the planning board is they miss their opportunity to carve out residential and separate it from business, and therefore I would uh, vote no on this, and then you got four months to prepare the next one for the next um, town meeting, and I think you can do a much better job. Uh, Nick Royal, uh, Winthrop Street. Um, I moved here just about 14 years ago, and we inherited a very rundown old barn, which we um, could have let fall down, but we decided then to um, re refurbish it. It was a nightmare process, and we ended up having to move it six feet, thanks to um, some people on the, on the planning board. I'm assuming they were the planning board anyway. Um, I am concerned... Um, especially because the map seems to be a little capricious. Uh, I am actually in the village residential district, but there are four houses on Martin Street that have been carved out. Um, they're all residential properties, and I was curious as to why. I know and I, I appreciate all the, all the work that Lisa and her team have done, but I think that the time uh, has come to reflect on this and maybe um, wait until next town meeting so we can all think about this a little further. And I'd love to know from Lisa, if it's possible, why those four houses right next door to me, uh, which are definitely residential, have been carved out of the village residential district. Thank you. Over here. Crocker, Southern Ave, I own Crocker's Boyard on John Wise Ave. <clears throat> I too appreciate the work the planning board's doing on this. I know it's a pretty big job. Um, I'm not against this 100%, but I think it needs more work. My problem is I have the boatyard out on John Wise Ave. If this passes, I'm rural residential. I came up with eight or nine other marine related businesses in town, mostly boat storage. If this passes, today we're on an even playing field this passes, the nine of us are zoned four different ways, which I don't think is fair. And I think that's true of some landscapers, some restaurants, and some other businesses in town. So I think it's a good start, but I think it needs to go back and get tweaked. Dom Dominic Olivo, 2 Southern. Uh, I'm Cape NSUP, by the way. Thank you for those of us who support my business and, and what we're able to bring to town. And I would continue to use that as an example of the types of businesses. Yes, I'm in the downtown district, I'm aware. Uh, the other types of businesses that we're straight up saying no to in all of that green zone. I also agree with Judd. I don't believe it's right to show the white general use districts. I know the whole bottom part, I wrote it down, the water protection overlay is that whole southern district there touching Manchester. So that's a lot of non-buildable, non-do-anythingable land. So to say that that's space left for business I think is disingenuous. Um, the change of use requirement is what I found out through this. It seems the one loophole might be if there's an open piece of land that does not, yes, have a use, that doesn't require 
the special permitting process, I think we can adjust town bylaws to fix that one little loophole, which seems that will protect a lot of people's concerns about what could possibly go next to them. Um, I'd like to point out that the MAPC study that we did that was a much bigger sample size, I think 430 participants instead of the 200 that filled out the survey to get this map to where it is, showed heat maps of where everybody would be okay with businesses covering that green zone, especially out to 133, uh, which is a state highway that is littered with businesses currently. I also believe that adding many pre-existing businesses into new residential zones is inherently unfair to those businesses, although they'll be grandfathered in for now. If they go to change anything about their business, they immediately have to go to a special permitting meeting, um, as well as it doesn't close off them from lawsuit liability like we've heard from residents in Manchester who had businesses that then became a zone, uh, residential zone, I'm sorry, and were keep winning their lawsuits but have to keep going to court because residents near them are now taking them to court. I also think it's worth pointing out that neither the village or rural residential zones allow mixed use, uh, not even by special permit in either one. I think that's a, a terrible overlook where we are well aware that we have housing needs and mixed use is the way that all of our strategic planning plans say we can help to grow and foster uh, a thriving community. Uh, one last point, because I've heard that the home occupation is a way that would allow many businesses. It's a good idea to point out that I live in my business and I do not count as a home occupancy. There's a lot of really stringent rules that go with that. Mainly, you can't have more than one employee who doesn't live there. You couldn't have two vehicles. Even say you were a, an electrician or someone who started a company and you did fit as a home occupancy business, if you grow a little bit and get a second truck, suddenly you no longer fit and you wouldn't be able to keep your business at your house in this zone. Uh, and lastly, just as uh, I, I hear the your home is your biggest investment, I think it's a great opportunity to look around, look at all the local businesses. We are residents as well. It's also my biggest investment. It's my home too. So. Try and keep that in mind. Big businesses aren't coming and exploiting Essex. We have a very high tax rate. We have very low <laughs> visitorship, and it doesn't make sense to run a business here for many reasons. So I think it's uh, important to keep that in mind. See how many empty businesses you see in the business zone before you believe that we are getting overrun with new businesses that are threatening the way of life. <clears throat> the fact that other towns have zoning doesn't make me feel like we need it. I think it is part of what makes Essex special. If we're worried about more changes that aren't wanted, let's continue to address bylaw language rather than creating giant zones that don't allow people to do with their properties what they've done in the past and furthermore prohibit anybody new from coming to town and doing something similar to what I've done and other families, right, if you don't want to use my business because I'm downtown, I think the Bubble Factory is another great one. It's a biz, uh, family owned business on Choate Street, dead in the center of that green zone, that if they had come to town just a few years later, would not have been able to open their business, raise their family uh, in town like all of us have the privilege of doing. So I urge you to vote no to this. I please. Hope that you listen to your local business community who is near in unison against the proposed plan as it sits today. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, right, Tom Duff, 39 County Road. I've been living here close to 60 years. In that time, population's gone up 50%. Number of houses have gone up more than 50%. That's a lot of growth. Been a lot of people doing excellent protection work, holding on to land for us, and I really appreciate that. When I was young, I was really grumpy about all these houses going up in my favorite back lots, and uh, you know, change was difficult. Um, but a lot of you wouldn't be here without those changes. And as I've grown up, I've learned to like these changes. The last few months when I look at Zillow, I haven't seen a house under a million bucks in this town. 1.5, little tiny place across the street you know, from the war houses, 1.9 on the market. I had two school teachers for parents. They couldn't move here now. 
There's a real economic challenge to living here. Um, and I, when I watch the protect the neighborhood or protect the town signs, what I'm thinking about are the families that live here and want to have an opportunity for their kids to live here as well. A lot of times, starting a business is part of that opportunity. And for me, that balances this huge pressure we're under from the population growth in the state, the popularity of the coast. Um, and it's an element of the town that I really appreciate. Uh, I do not want to live in a town where everybody can afford a house that's one and a half million dollars. That's, that's not the place I want to live. So I appreciate these views, but I appreciate the people, and I appreciate these young people that want to stay here. I think a lot of us love the way the town is, but it's not frozen. This is not a Disneyland exhibit. It's a lot of people that are trying to make a life. If I was 12 years old, I would have voted for this. It would have fit my mentality at that point in time. It does not fit it now. Uh, this is the, the restrictions with this, this green is too broad. The limitations on the business that where you have to go and meet this class that's not really clearly defined and rules out a lot of the businesses that I see successful around me right now. So I, I'm going to vote against this. I hope some of you do. Plenty of you do. Thanks. I'm John Guerin from Belcher Street. Um, I've been in town for 62 years. Mrs. Cassidy was my first grade teacher as well. And um, I've been an attorney for 36 years as a real estate attorney, and I read zoning uh, bylaws basically for a living. <clears throat> With that said, though I was originally open to well thought out changes to the zoning and land use regulations, the flawed product before us, including the gerrymandering of the general use zones, some in, some out, is arbitrary and capricious and may not withstand a court's scrutiny, and maybe not even the Attorney General's review. The mistakes in both the assessor's maps and thereby the proposed zoning maps, which use the flawed assessor's maps, need to be corrected before anything like this can, is passed. Also, Chapter 40A, Section 4, the Mass General Laws requires uniform districts. The spot zoning herein proposed is anything but uniform. There is also mistakes in quoting the Mass General Laws that I brought up in the first article that was needed to be corrected in this one. Um, also, the proposed zoning map has in the general use district in white several properties that cannot be developed. The golf course for one, Lane's property, Turf Meadow, which is shown as everything north of County Road and off of Western Avenue. And then there are several properties that are already controlled or owned by a checkerboard of lots with the MECT, Greenbelt, and trustees of reservations that are not depicted on the incomplete proposed zoning maps. Many of the general use zones, the area left alone from the proposed changes, are marsh, wetland, and others non-accessible and arguably only the proposed map, um, only on the proposed map to make one think that there is a lot of land left for business, and there is not. State Route 133 and 22 bisect the town and are the busiest roads in town. There is a large mixed contingent of homes and businesses on both roads that most mostly work together symbiotically. However, once a change of use is proposed, it could delete those businesses, or at least changes to them, unless the arbitrary decision of seven planning board members allows an owner to make that change either physical or to its use. No new businesses will be allowed in most of Essex, unless you meet the strict requirements of a home occupation. Both sides of 133 and 22 should be left alone for mixed residential and business uses. While I'm noting most of John Wise Avenue is already protected privately. A required special permit by its terms could require six months or more time to even get a simple physical change. Public hearing is 65 days potentially, 90 days for the planning board to make their decision, and then another 20 days after the town clerk posts that decision. 
A lot of homeowners are concerned about their effect from a property's businesses, lighting, hours, noise, traffic, views, which can all be addressed with land use regulations and without making the entire town residential with only room for the businesses that now exist. Essex is already restricted on what can be built due to the nature of our clay soils and finite space in the town sewer. Proposals to expand the sewer are mere proposals. Make no mistake about this, every landowner in town is giving up property rights now that they have if this proposal passes. Unlike the downtown district, which passed the previous town meeting, which was sold to town meeting as a way to make more properties conforming, this proposal now before us will make many dozens of properties that are currently conforming, non-conforming. If we vote for this zoning, then any changes to it, even to correct it, will require a two-thirds vote. Let me repeat that. If we vote for this zoning, then any changes to it, even to correct it, will require a two-thirds vote, which could all be but impossible. And while I recommend or commend those who have worked on this, at the very least, the planning board should not have bitten off such a huge change all at once and should go back to make the corrections before ever bringing this back to town meeting. I was at one of the earlier planning meetings and stated this. I also attended the public hearing on the 6th of November, this 6th of November, via Zoom. Because the public hearing, emphasized hearing, was so late in the process, anything the board heard at the hearing fell on deaf ears as the board closed the hearing and immediately voted to put the zoning proposal as written to the town meeting tonight. The idea of a hearing is to listen to the people and then amend the article if need be. I submit that given John, no time between the public hearing. Five minutes, you're all stop. Okay, I'm almost done. I submit that given no time between the public hearing and the town meeting, a flawed proposal is being forced upon us. The board knows it, that it's flawed, but they're still pushing it. I can't in good conscience vote in favor of these changes until the flaws are corrected. Two-thirds vote to make the corrections at a later date are not realistic <clears throat> and highly unlikely to occur. I'm not against zoning, just this zoning. Uh, Kevin Cook, 54 Martin Street. Uh, tonight in Article 2, we voted to uh, add a new definition to our bylaw for a village business. Uh, in Article 3, we have additional language around a village business, which I'll paraphrase to say means a small business scaled and suited for its surroundings. In reviewing the changes around zoning, it struck me that being on Martin Street, I was permitted by special permit to have a small business scaled or suited to my surroundings, but my fellow colleagues in the green areas, in the rural sections of town, are not. A lot of the concerns I've heard tonight seem like they may be able to be answered by allowing a, quote, village business, definitional issue aside, in the rural parts of town. I think Cape Ann SUP competitor two in a rural district would be allowed. I think uh, there were references on 133. I think you could get businesses that meet a small business scaled and suited to its surroundings. And the rest of Article 3, paraphrasing again, to me says that on a special permit, an applicant must show that they're going to be a decent neighbor. They're not going to negatively affect your neighborhood. Uh, they're, you're going to have appropriate uh, traffic considerations, safety and infrastructure, parking, buffers, et cetera, and there's a process to approve that. So I ask, and I'd like to make a motion, I have it in writing because I know you need it, but I move to amend the table for rural residential districts on page 13 of the handout where it says commercial village business, there's an N. I move to amend that section to bring it in line with the previous table for where I live, which says 
a commercial building, an existing business use is permitted, and an existing residential use is by special permit. Thank you. You have that in writing? I do. Because I'll have to look at it to see if it's in scope or not. <clears throat> I'll be right back. Excuse me, uh, can I get a second first on the motion? And what this motion does is if you, on your handout on page 13 of the article or the warrant, <clears throat> it changes in the village business where commercial is not allowed to a special permit, which is considered less restrictive, so I'm going to allow it, the amendment. So we're going to move on to the amendment at this point and discussion on the amendment. Is it on? Uh, Again, I haven't heard anybody come up here and say they, they, they're advocating for industrial uses in rural areas. I haven't heard anybody come up here and say that that's why they want and that's why they oppose this zoning district. I've heard people who have said they're going to vote yes and people who have said they're going to vote no <coughs> cite to the fact that Cape Ann Sup 2 uh, can exist in a go forward. We can't have young people who want to move to the, move into this town and figure out a mixed use. I think uh, the highlights for me, a small business scaled and suitable for your surroundings. You get to stand in front of seven of your fellow uh, compatriots and say, I think this is a scaled and suited business. Uh, and, and again, I paraphrase, you're showing that you're going to be a decent neighbor under a special permit and that we should move forward. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment. Hello. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't know how you can fix uh, one thing in a chart when the whole description for a rural zoning district is specifying all what can be done in there. You would have to rewrite the whole thing. So if we're going to have an amendment, I would say take the rural district out in its entirety and then we could vote on that. We'll have a mo I'll put a motion for that. that be, if you want to do that, that's a separate All right. amendment. We're going I, to handle I, this amendment. I don't see how the planning board could, could agree to that based on all the description. And you can just change the chart. That doesn't work. Any other? Maybe, maybe the planning board would like to respond to that. Or council. I, I believe he's saying that you putting that special permit on that one, art, one item in that chart changes the whole chart? I'm saying that the chart is only a small piece of the rural residential zoning district. And you can't just change the chart and then say, oh, well, good, business is allowed there. It describes what's allowed in all the text. So you would have to rewrite the whole um, article. I believe someone, I believe it. So, uh, so the, the, the solution here, um, 
that would clarify, uh, would simplify actually Kevin's proposal. The, the main difference between village and rural was that um, the village district allowed um, business uses by special permit. Other than that, there's really not substantial difference between them. The idea was to keep the rural districts without the opportunity for businesses. If the motion that's being made is to allow, similar to the village district, to allow businesses through a, a special permit process, the easy answer is that everything is the same. It's one village and rural are the same. That's the only substantial difference is that village district, village businesses are allowed by special permit in the village district and not allowed in the rural. So the, the motion would be to change everything green to purple on the map, on the maps. Well, first of all, we have to get through this amendment. If, we, if, if this amendment fails or passes, then we'll move on to a different amendment, but I have a second on this amendment, so I have to... R right, so... Um, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to clarify what, because I, I understand what Kevin's intent is, mm -hmm. and so that they, and I, and I get Judd's point, because the language that's written around rural district, that the easy way to combine those two, what Kevin's saying and what Judd is saying, is to say, instead, make everything a village residential district. Kevin, you want to address your amendment? All I am saying is allow, quote, village business in rural areas. Period. End of story. Not a single person has stood up here tonight and said they don't like zoning because they want to be able to put an industrial use in a rural area. And I think if that's what they want and that's why they're voting it down, I think we should hear that. We've heard both sides say it's disappointing that young people and people moving to Essex living in rural areas can't do exactly what Cape Ann SUP did. I think they should, and if people are against zoning because they want to put a waste facility or a, um, a self-storage unit in the middle of an otherwise residential rural area, they should stand up and say so. So, Lisa, do you think the amend the amended article as stands, just changing that to stand uh, special permit for commercial, will save uh, work, or will it muddy the waters?
have some quiet. Council, is, uh, Council can expound on this, but he has said that he does not believe changing the no, not acceptable to special permit on that is, would cause any problems at all with the, art, with the article. So he is saying we can move on with this amendment as he has been proposed. So is there any discussion on the amendment as proposed? Mr. Neal. This is on. Ed Neal, 15 Western Ave. Uh, I'm not in favor of this amendment or any other amendments. Uh, this is a s comprehensive <clears throat> document in front of us. Took the planning board a long time to put it together. There's been comments tonight here raising various concerns about the uh, issues involved with the complexity of it. <clears throat> and I don't think it would be effective to re-adjudicate it now with a committee of 200 here tonight by each person getting up saying, I want to amend it to incorporate or eliminate this or my area or what I do for a living. It's not effective. It's not appropriate at this point. Correct. Just vote no against any amendment. <laughs> Let's get this vote over with. Thank you. Any other comment on the amendment to the article? Uh, so no other discussion. All those in favor of the amendment, raise your card. All those opposed? The amendment does not pass. Back to the main article, and I believe you are up next. Etsy Ridge, Saugan East Road. I think we're not ready to vote, so I'd like to make a motion to postpone to a time definite, which would be the May annual meeting. I, I can't, I can't, we can't put it to the town meeting. You need to, we, this, this body cannot put it on another meeting. We can put then it I'll to, back, it to the, back to the, back to the, hold on before you say that. We can put it to the planning board as a committee, or we can definitely postpone, or we can give it okay. back to the planning board. We will, I may, I move that we indefinitely postpone this article. I would need, I, <laughs> Betsy, I need that in writing, if I could. Is there a second to that? Any discussion on the motion to indefinitely postpone? Hold on a second. It is debatable. Any discussion on postponing? All those in favor of postponing Article 3 indefinitely, please. Majority. Raise your card. This is a. It, if you, this is the, this is the vote to post indefinitely postpone Article Three. All those in favor of postponing Article Three, raise your card. All those opposed. The motion passes. We will now move on to Article Four. <laughs> no, I said majority, isn't it? Oh, okay. It's just a majority. Gotcha. I got it written down. Okay. I got it written down. I thought we talked about that. that. I thought we talked about you that. Your order and we said two thirds. No, no, no. I had those. Are I had all the different things and then stuff. All right. Uh, postponement. You all you'll be voting on is the postponement. Hold on one second. What's her name, Betsy? What? Madsen. There's somebody wants to. Yes, yes, uh, we can reconsider. Postpone. You, just raise a point of order. Can I have this one? There's a, there's a motion on the floor before everyone leaves. I'll need that in writing. I'll need it in writing. There's a motion to uh, reconsider Article 3. I'll need it. Is there a second?
I got it. Good, good. What do you have, everyone? Uh, quiet up for a second. We've got a, we got a motion to reconsider. Is there a second to that? Did I already ask for that? Is there a second to re any discussion? I can have a discussion. So an article, this article would, if, if approved, would, would bring up or rescind or bring us back to the motion to um, postpone. Doesn't get us to the main article, but it gets us to the postponement of article. Sure. So the last article that passed was the uh, motion to indefinitely postpone article three. You can reconsider that vote anytime during the meeting. Once, <clears throat> if it gets if it gets approved, we will go back to the the, the vote that, to postpone. If it does not, it, we don't open back up the discussion on the postponement, and we move on to Article Four. Is that clear? So, so if you, I guess, if you vote yes on this uh, on this motion to reconsider. We will go back to the, uh, the motion to postpone Article 3 and discuss that again. That can be changed. So a yes vote gets us back to discussing the postponement, and definitely postpone. A no vote says we're ending the discussion for the night, and we're going to move on to the Article 4. Everyone understand that? So all those in favor of uh, reconsidering Article uh, the mo motion to post, uh, indefinitely postpone, raise your card. All those opposed to reconsidering that, the motion fails. We are done with Article 3, postponement. Can we um, kind of quiet it down? We've got more articles to go, please. Cliff, we have Article 4. Article 4. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. For Article 4. I, Cliff Agaloff, move that the town vote to amend Hold on one section 2-10 Town of Essex General Bylaws relative to the fees for filing with the Conservation Commission as shown in Article 4 for the fall town meeting. This is a motion that would... Is, is there a second? Discussion? This is a motion that would uh, permit the Conservation Commission to charge fees for various applications and amendments for uh, doing business with the town. It is basically a user fee for filing with the Conservation Commission, and it brings our commission in line with other town departments, such as plumbing, electrical, um, other, other, towns, other um, town agencies and boards that um, charge fees to submit applications. Any further discussion? All those in favor of Article 4, raise your card. All those opposed, raise your card. The motion passes. Article 5. David. Am I on? There we go. Uh, before I read Article 5, uh, I just want to remind everybody that um, this Saturday night, the Essex Fire Company is holding their 34th fourth annual spaghetti supper. It's our... Hey. Um, it is from four to seven. It is our one fundraiser for the year to um, generate some income. We use the income basically to buy uh, 
trinkets that the, are not funded by the town. Um, takeout orders are available via um, cell phone or text message to 978-778-4554. And this phone number is also uh, available on the uh, um, Town of Essex Fire Department website. That's my little plug. <laughs> Article 5. I, David Perrine, move the town vote to transfer from the ambulance fund the sum of $525,000 to purchase a fully equipped new ambulance for the fire department to replace one of the fire department's existing ambulances and anything incidental thereto, and further to authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into any necessary agreements to effectuate the purchase for the purpose of this vote and to dispose of the old ambulance by sale or trade. Is there a second? second. Discussion, Dave? Uh, just a point of interest, this purchase is fully funded. Um, it, it requires um, no money from the taxpayer. Um, it's a you know, win-win for everybody. It is self-funded from the ambulance fund which is generated through transports. <laughs> Any it's further discussion? Money. Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 5, raise your card. All those opposed, motion passes. Thank you. Article 6. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $141,000 to purchase two fully equipped new vehicles for the police department to replace existing police vehicles and anything incidental thereto. In further, to authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into any necessary agreements to effectuate the purposes of this vote and to dispose of the old police vehicles by sell or trade. Is there a second? Discussion, Ruth? Pretty limited discussion. Um, we, our Essex Police Department currently runs a fleet of five vehicles. The ages of those vehicles are 2016, 2018, 2020, and two 2021 vehicles. Um, two of the vehicles need to be replaced. They've met their life expectancy, and we're just looking to um, get a positive vote for that. Any other discussion? All those in favor of Article 6, raise your card. All those opposed, motion passes. Article 7. I, Nicholas Ellis, move that Article 7 be indefinitely postponed. Is there a second? All those in favor? Any opposed? Postponed. Article 8. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $25,000 to site select, design, cost estimate, prepare procurement, and contract documents and obtain permits for a new municipal fuel depot on town property and anything incidental thereto. Is there a second? Discussion, Ruth? So pretty limited discussion. This is um, an item that's been on the selectmen's long-term potential um, kind of long-range forecast for things that have been asked for by different departments. So the DPW, the police department, and the fire department all use both gasoline and diesel. And although it's been on the list for a long time, it's finally bubbled to the surface where this is an opportunity to save um, money for the taxpayers, where we can buy our fuel off the state bid and we would have access to it 24 hours a day. So it's been presented to us for many years for the town to be self-sufficient. It would allow us to get fuel after hours. So instead of when um, local service stations are closed, we would have access to it 24 hours a day. In storm emergencies, it would run by generator should we lose power and things like that. For the discussion over here. Yes, Mr. Moderator. I didn't jump up fast enough being old, but I got a oh, name and on. name and address. Name and address. Oh, sorry. Roland Adams, two Belcher Street. Um, I didn't jump up quite fast enough, but I'm curious whether the finance committee has any recommendations on all of these money issues. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting, I asked the chair of the finance if they supported all of the finance, all the financial articles. And they have responded, yes, they do. Thank you. Further? Gil Frieden, 104 John Wise Ave. Vote no on Article 8. 
The Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2050 provides details on the actions of the Commonwealth, that the Commonwealth will undertake to put Massachusetts on a pathway to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions in 2050. Massachusetts towns like Brookline, Arlington, Lexington are leading efforts to restrict fossil fuel infrastructure in new constructions and major renovations, aiming to align with the state's new carbon neutrality goal of 2050. So, once again, I'm up here hoping Essex will set a good example. So, here's my argument against Essex funding and building its own fuel depot. Obviously, one, alignment with state and local decarbonization goals. Massachusetts aims to be carbon neutral in only 26 years. Towns and statewide are, towns statewide are actively phasing out fossil fuel infrastructure. Constructing a new fossil fuel depot is so stupid and directly contradicts these goals and risks future obsolescence. No on Article 8. Two, inefficiency and risks. Why would anyone want to build a gas station within sight of our beautiful river? Don't we pollute it enough? Fossil fuel infrastructure, infrastructure installed now will need costly removal and replacement in the future as policies shift towards whatever or electrification. This represents a poor long-term investment. No on Article 8. Rising support for clean energy. Towns like Brookline and Lexington have had overwhelming support to not to, to to, do, to not fund things like this. They, that demonstrates growing momentum for clean energy adoption. Essex could instead focus on renewable energy projects aligning with the statewide transition. No on Article 8. Fossil fuel reliance, so number four, fossil fuel reliance perpetuates high operating costs due to volatile fuel prices. So and at this point, I would like to make a quick little advertisement for taking the bus. I am your Essex-appointed board member for the Cape Ann Transit Authority, and I made the motion to get <clears throat> bus service here in Essex. You can go from Essex Elementary all the way to Walgreens next to the Rose Baker Senior hey, Gil, Center in Gilly, Gloucester. It's, that is... Totally but, irrelevant so to. So we must use public transportation, but I digress. But we can't back do that to, with the PPW trucks. not having a fuel depot in Essex. Number five, community reputation and leadership. Following the lead of towns prioritizing clean energy enhances Essex's image as a forward-thinking community committed to combating climate change. Were you, were you here at the town meeting when we were crazy enough to revoke our status as a green community? Let's not be crazy again. A fuel depot ties Essex to outdated systems and hampers its ability to lead. We must avoid a, fuel, a fossil fuel depot and redirect funds towards anything. Of course, I'm going to say the senior center. But let me just close with Essex can future-proof its infrastructure, reduce long-term costs, and align with Massachusetts's climate goals. No on Article 8. Mr. Moderator, um, I've been asked to let you know that people are talking and it's hard for the audience to hear. Yes, could you all please kind of be quiet. If you need to speak with other people, you can go outside the doors so we can all appreciate the discussion. Janet Carlson, 24 Apple Street. Um, I'd like to start by saying that for once, I agree with my fellow resident, Billy Flower. Um, but my, my comment, um, actually, I'd like to start with a question. Is it possible for us to know how much building the fuel depot would cost before we spend 25000 on a study? And the, my comment has to do with the fact that I know that the fuel depot came up um, around the, the fact that Ernie's gas station was for sale and there would be no diesel um, for sale in Essex, but the realtor handling the sale of Ernie's has made it clear that the new owner will be selling diesel. So I wonder why we would want to make it a municipal enterprise. Why not let diesel be a business in town since we've been talking so much about businesses in town? Brent, Brennan, you want to answer the question? You want to answer the question on the cost? Yes, so uh, the question about the cost, the $25,000 would be an engineering design and it would include a complete um, cost estimate that would inform us if the town went to the next step, which would be to potentially approve construction funding. 
Ruth is going to speak to your other question. Gina, great question. Um, this has nothing to do with Ernie's closing. Um, I know that the realtor that was put on Facebook, but this bubbling to the surface has nothing to do with a local business. This has to do with our ability to access diesel and gasoline 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't have that ability with Ernie's. If we want to use Ernie's as an example, he's open from 7 to 5 or whatever, Monday through Friday. So this, ha this is about the town being self-sufficient. And then just to answer Gil's point, these tanks would be above ground. They would not be below ground. And the vehicles that we use in town, these are not available in electric vehicles. So just want to point that out as well, these you know, fire trucks and ambulances and there are electric police cars. I'm not sure that anyone would want to do that. But, um, but the vehicles that we use, especially with the DPW for plowing snow and so forth, are not available as electric vehicles. And if we were to get an electric fire engine, which do exist, and California has one, they are at least double the cost, and in some cases, much more. You all set? Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Can you hear me? Nick Ellis, Rocky Hill Road. Uh, I'm also the chair of the DPW Commission. Uh, I'm here to speak in favor of this motion, uh, mainly because we at the DPW are out plowing snow in the middle of the night while everybody, including the folks who run the gas stations, are close. Um, I appreciate the idea of carbon neutrality. I think that it's an excellent goal. Uh, the reality is that there's not a plow truck for us to drive that runs on batteries. Um, so, at the end of the day, in order for us to be able to dependably plow your roads, um, we need to have access to diesel fuel 24 hours a day. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 8, raise your card. All those opposed? Motion passes. Article 9. Alvin Gajaro, 93 Martin Street. I, Alvin Gajaro, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of 7,500 to purchase equipment and install new computer hardware systems with related software to replace client connection hardware for connection to the town's remote desktop servers and anything incidental thereto. Is there a second? Alvin, discussion? Or? Any further discussion? All those in favor of Article 9, raise your card. All those opposed? Motion passes. Article 10. I, Nicholas Ellis, move that the town vote to transfer from Water Enterprise retained earnings the sum of $259,202 to design and construct improvements to the town's public water supply wells, said sum to be added to the American Rescue Plan Act funds approved by the Board of Selectmen for the project and any incidental thereto. Sec is there a second? second. Discussion? So um, we have been allocated an, uh, a sum of money from ARPA, which is um, a sum that we don't have to pay back. Uh, as part of our planning to spend that sum of money, we worked with MassDEP to figure out what we needed to do at our wells to be in compliance with DEP regulations. Uh, among those requirements are flow metering, monitoring, and a number of other upgrades. Uh, in addition, we need to do structural work on our wells. Uh, the roofs are leaking. Uh, we have portions of the wells that are confined spaces that require extensive training for people to enter and work in. Um, when we bid the contract, the overall bid came in higher than the amount of money that we received from ARPA. So the money that we're asking for here is in order to allow us to construct all of the upgrades to the wells and keep uh, water flowing to your homes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 10, raise your card. Those opposed, raise your card. Motion passes. Article 11. I, Peter D. Fippen, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $15,000 to be used as a match to a state legislative earmark for further study of environmental issues associated with Chebacco Lake, the Owife Brook, 
and surrounding watershed and anything incidental or related thereto. Is there a second? Discussion? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, we all realize that uh, Shabaco Lake and the Grove is a real jewel for the town of Essex. And I think most of us remember a few years back when it was closed for, um, or at least the lake was closed for uh, several weeks because of a, um, a dangerous uh, algal bloom. And the Lake Association has put together some money to study what needs to be studied because that algal bloom and other water quality problems are related to water quality issues, obviously. So we, we now have um, a study outline in place of what we should be doing and what we should be looking at in order to, at some future date, get funding from the state or the feds for doing implementation to address some of these issues. So we have $20,000 um, in earmark thanks to uh, Senator Bruce Tarr. We have a, a commitment from the town of Hamilton, which is, uh, has jurisdiction over the southern portion of the lake, for 15000 this year and 15000 next year. And we're looking for 15000 from the town this year to start the study. Any further discussion? All those in favor of Article 11, raise your card. All those opposed, raise your card. The motion passes. Article 12. I, Jody Harris, move the town vote to transfer from free cash the following sums to be added to the following funds. $100,000 to purchase of vehicles and major equipment that qualify as capital purchases fund, $3,000 to the municipal street light, lighting repair and maintenance fund, $20,000 to the public safety building repair and maintenance fund, $20,000 to the climate change fund, and to transfer the amount appropriated for the downtown street lighting project under Article 8 of the Fall Town Meeting of November 14, 2022, the sum of $70,000 to the purchase of vehicles and major equipment that qualify as capital purchases fund for a total transfer to said fund of $170,000. Is there a second? Discussion? Um, we're, we're basically funding vehicle stabilization accounts and um, a, a, a couple of other um, general stabilization accounts from our free cash. And the streetlight, um, $70,000 was an appropriation that uh, wasn't used uh, prior. And uh, as you saw this evening, uh, we really need to be funding our vehicle stabilization account. We have two cruisers this year that need to be replaced. The others, as you heard, nothing is newer than 2021. Um, in addition, uh, we'll have some uh, another fire truck need. Uh, our tanker truck is 30 years old, and we, since a third of our town does not have town water, our tanker truck is a lifeline uh, to firefighting in this town. Any further discussion? Any? Hi, Annie Cameron, uh, Pickering Street. Is there no um, allocation for the school apportionment fund? No, there's not. Why? We, um, in, <laughs> when the fund was created, we put $50,000 in. The $50,000 became apparent that when the money went in the fund, it A, needed a, a vote to come out of the fund, but it also was a one-time funding mechanism which we will most likely use this year, but it doubled, it put us in the hole by $100,000 the next year. Any further discussion over here? Randall Sword, Noah's Hill Way. Uh, I'm wondering what the climate change fund is, um, what, how much we fund it, and why we owe it any more money. Mr. Zabricki? The Climate Change Fund was set up by a previous town meeting and funded with a small amount of money. This is the first time that a subsequent town meeting has had a chance to put a, more money into the fund. What the fund does is it basically allows the town to participate in uh, projects that will help the town stay resilient from climate change uh, problems like flooding on the causeway, like uh, the salt marsh going from high marsh to eventually open water, stuff like that. Um, 
and again, this is a chance to put a little bit more money in it. Uh, some of the other funds are much more well developed. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 12, raise your card. All those opposed, raise your card. The motion passes. Article 13. I, Nicholas Ellis, move that the town vote to transfer from the Sewer Enterprise Fund retained earnings in the sum of $25,000 to design, engineer, and construct repairs, upgrades, improvements, and or replacements to any aspect of the municipal sewer system, including but not limited to replacement of grinder pumps and related equipment and anything incidental thereto. Is there a second? second. Discussion? So I'm a little bit of a broken record on this one. Uh, we've been asking for money to replace grinder pumps for the last five years or so. Um, I just had to clarify with Mandy how many we have left. We've got about 40 left that we need to replace. This 25,000 will pay for about five to be replaced uh, for the remainder of this year. And then you'll see me again in the spring asking you for more money to replace more of them. Further discussion? Of Fitzgibbon, 18 Main Street. Uh, hey, could you, in the DPW, could you explain, like, we were gone through and, explain, and, and replaced all these grinder pumps and we got like 40 left, but my understanding was is that we promised certain residents grinder pumps until like the end of time, <laughs> basically. It's all residents, yes. So is there any plan to like eventually phase out grinder pumps? That's my question. So we cannot, uh, based on our infrastructure, phase out grinder pumps. Um, the agreement for the town to take on ownership of the grinder pumps was done prior to my tenure here. Um, so, uh, yes, ultimately we will continue to pay to replace grinder pumps. However, I do want to point out that what we're replacing now are essentially what are substandard pumps that break all the time. Um, the original pumps that were put in part, as part of the sewer project just were not very good. Um, the ones that we are replacing um, and that we have replaced are significantly sturdier. Uh, we have far fewer calls to repair and replace them. Um, so ultimately, once we do replace all of the grinder pumps, the hope is that with the sewer rate, we can have enough money to just essentially maintain them. Further discussion? Questions? Annie Cameron, Pickering Street. Is there any value in buying more grinder pumps now? I mean, we have this bright, shining future in January of 2025. Um, is there any concern about costs of those increasing? And they have, yes, and to your point. Um, however, we are essentially reallocating sewer enterprise money, and we that's all that we have at the moment, essentially. Can I ask another question? You can sure. continue, yes. I sh let me clarify that statement. We have more sewer enterprise, but not a lot more, and yeah. we like to keep some so that we don't have zero. Do you want anyone to make a motion to increase this 25000 so you could buy more now? Well, it would come out of the sewer enterprise fund, so I personally do not know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor of Article 13, raise your card. All those opposed? Motion passes. Article... 14. I, Jody Harris, move the town vote to transfer from the dredging match fund the sum of $9,450 to replenish the Finance Committee's reserve fund for fiscal year 2025. Second? Uh, Is there a second? Sorry. Basically, um, this money was borrowed from the Finance uh, Reserve in order to uh, move uh, moorings out of the river so that the dredging company could come in. It needed to be done in an expedient way, and this was the quickest way to get the money to be able to pay the mooring company and then uh, be reimbursed. For the discussion, all those in favor of Article 14, raise your card. All those opposed, raise your card. Motion passes. Article 15. I, Jody Harris, move the town vote to transfer from the amount ap appropriated for the downtown street lighting project under Article 18 of the Fall Town Meeting of November 13, 2023, the sum of 
$126 to fund the town's other post-employment benefits trust fund. Is there a second? second. Discussion? Um, this basically is our um, unfunded liability, uh, which was uh, our total liability stands today at uh, $4.2 million. We have 2.6 uh, in the bank. Uh, this funds uh, retirement insurances. Uh, we are uh, chipping away at um, uh, getting the liability, uh, meeting the liability to $4.2 million. Uh, we're, it's within striking distance. Um, a, a plan that the Finance Committee has, it looks to be about four years where we'll be fully funded. Uh, why is this important to you? It's important to you because when we get to the fully funded part, $200,000 that we pay now out of our town's operating budget goes on your tax rate. It will no longer be there. About between $150,000 and $250,000 annually, we're using free cash to fund our liability. We will no longer need that. So uh, it's important uh, for us to close that gap, and we're getting incredibly close. For the discussion, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep. Brian Gressler, 30 Chote. I had a question, Mr. Moderator. Um, how much does this amount compare to previous years when we didn't have uh, the streetlight funds to reappropriate? So it depended. Um, year to year, it was 150,000, 175,000, 200,000. This was already free cash that was appropriated at another town meeting for a project that wasn't able to be completed. So uh, it was a great use of our uh, reappropriation of that fund to chip away and, and get, the, I think it'll get us to around $2.9 million. Right, but we're choosing to fund substantially more than we had previously with this amount, and so. We try and fund it yeah. absolutely as much as possible every year. And again, this is uh, free cash. Free cash is what we use for capital projects and OPEB. We, don't do, we do not use free cash for operating expenses. Right. Yep. Between this and Article 12, this is, the, with the exception of about 450 bucks, this is the last of the streetlight funds. Was there ever a full accounting of how much money we lost? It lost for the streetlights? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yep. I'm just curious. Mr. Zabricki. The street lighting project for downtown, there was $100,000 appropriated and separately $263,000 appropriated, which is this article, so that's 363. Um, when we started to build that project, we found immediately that the project was replete with um, utility conflicts and the project couldn't go in. And so I was able to work with the state grant makers to get the non-refundable um, equipment that we had already purchased because it was custom fully covered and that's about two hundred thousand dollars by uh, non non town money so in the end we the town spent about twenty three thousand out of that three hundred and sixty three thousand and has two hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment to show for it it is not installed anywhere yet but it could be used somewhere else in town further discussion mike mike dyer uh, 9 indian rock lane um, I know many of us would like to forget about the uh, downtown lighting project, um, but town meeting uh, at previous meetings saw fit to, to put a good bit of money into improving the downtown via that lighting project. Um, I'm just wondering if there are, if anybody's considering other ways of improving the downtown, making making the causeway some other way more attractive, maybe an alternate lighting project, uh, some way to spend it to study and address parking. Um, this seems like, I mean, town meeting can certainly do it. It just seems like uh, a switch from, uh, from a need that town meeting saw before to meeting a completely different need. Um, I would hope that m maybe we could retain some of it against future downtown improvement projects. I, was there a question, Mike? No, or there's, no, there's no question. Got it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor of Article 15, raise your card. All those opposed, raise your card. 
Motion passes. Article 16. I, Ruth R. Preen, move that Article 16 be indefinitely postponed. Is there a second? Any dis no discussion? We're good. Um, all those in favor of Article 16 being postponed, raise your card. Any opposed? Postponed. Article 17, the last one. Last one, I promise. I, Jody Harris, move the town vote to transfer from available funds the amounts shown on Article 17 handout to amend the fiscal year 2025 town operating budget approved at the annual town meeting of May 6, 2024, with the following addition. The $10,000 also be transferred from free cash to the equipment repair and maintenance line item in Department 220, the fire department, increasing the current amount in said line item from $11,000 to $21,000. Is there a second? Discussion? Hi. You're on. <laughs> Nick, so, so is it possible, and Brendan probably can answer this, can the town lend the water whatever fund money to buy grinder pumps? <laughs> no. No. If you can't use the, that money, can you, know, you use this? That was the last article, but we're on no, 17. I know that. But could you allocate? I, another smart person sitting next to me said that was a good idea, too. Can you, um, I would not comment. Um, can you take money here and lend it to, and I don't know if that's possible. I'm just asking if that's a possible thing to lend He's, he's going to answer that. Do you have another question? That's the question. Enterprise fund, and then pay it back. Can we lend them money? I'm going to say. Yes, uh, free cash can be used for any purpose, including spending on enterprise fund, but it's not considered good financial practice because there are sometimes circumstances that doesn't allow within the fiscal year the enterprise fund to return the money. And once you go beyond that, it becomes a mismatch and it's a problem. I think I can speak to it a different way though. Um, once all the debt for the sewer system has been retired, which is gonna happen I think in fiscal 27, there is a fund that gets freed up and that's because the town got all the loans for the sewer system at either 0% or less than 0%, yet the betterment payers paid 2%. That's going to be about $2 million that we can't touch until the debt is gone that will be available for capital needs of the sewer system. So that money will be there. They just don't have it yet. So, so we're kind of we have to up wait. against a wall. We may have to wait. To, right. No, I don't, I don't think they're against the wall because they're going to continue to install grinders. They're not going to run out of grinders. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm, okay. I, we're good. You know what I'm saying. I like the way you're thinking, though, but all those in favor of Article 17, raise your card. All those opposed, 